Do you remember ESA's JUICE mission that launched last year for our celestial neighbour, Jupiter? Well, this week you may have heard that JUICE came back to Earth. Wait, hold on a second, what do you mean it's come back to Earth? Doesn't it take like years and years just to get to Jupiter? JUICE didn't take the Hohmann transfer orbit that I talked about last week for getting to Mars. Ah, of course, because JUICE is so far away, right? So it must have taken a gravity assist from Earth to boost it to its final destination, right? Nope, wrong. This maneuver last week actually was to slow down JUICE. Are you confused yet? Hey Space Cats, I'm Dr Maggie Liu and continuing on from our topic of space trajectories, in this week's video I'm talking about gravity assist and the JUICE mission, so let's begin. Gravitational assist, also known as gravitational slingshot, is a type of flyby mission. It's a technique used in space travel to change the velocity of a spacecraft by using the gravitational potential of a planet or a moon. By carefully planning the trajectory of the spacecraft, you can use that planet or moon's gravity to change direction, accelerate, or even decelerate. Yes, you heard me right, decelerate. And you can do all of this without the need of any additional fuel. So it's probably no surprise that this technique is commonly used throughout space exploration, allowing spacecraft to reach very distant destinations with limited fuel. So before I explain to you about JUICE and why it's breaking, and why anyone would even want to decelerate in the first place, let's talk about how this works. As a spacecraft approaches a planet, it's attracted by that planet's gravity. This pulls the spacecraft in and causes it to accelerate as it moves closer to the planet. That's just Kepler's second law. It tells us that as the spacecraft moves closer to the planet, similar to a planet moving closer to the sun, it will accelerate, gaining speed. It swings around the planet because the massive gravitational potential of the planet bends the spacecraft's trajectory. As it moves away from the planet, it decelerates because you're working against the gravity of that planet. So schematically, it looks like this. Let's say, for example, our planet here is capital P and our spacecraft, little s. We're looking at this in a 2D coordinate space, so we have x and y axes. And let's say our spacecraft is approaching from below the planet with a velocity little us. Using vector notation, we can break this down into its x and y components. Since the spacecraft is only moving in the y direction, the positive y direction, the x component of the velocity is zero, and we call the y component of the velocity little usy. Original, yes I know. Now sure, as the satellite approaches the planet, it accelerates, and you see this in the vectors, they increase in magnitude. But when it's moving away from the planet, it decelerates, going back to its original speed, exiting at a different angle. The final velocity, little vs, has only an x component and no y component, and this is just because the angles changed. And since the speeds were the same at the start and at the end, little us is equal to little vs, so little usy is equal to little vsx. Now most importantly here is that this is from the planet's perspective. Here, the planet is at rest, it's not moving. So its initial velocity, capital UP, is equal to its final velocity, capital VP, which is equal to zero. It might seem like the spacecraft gains speed and then loses speed symmetrically, but the problem here is that actually this planet is not at rest at all. In the grander scheme of things, the planet is actually orbiting around our sun, and it has an orbital velocity. So now, looking at the perspective of the sun, let's say the planet has an orbital speed of capital UP and is moving along the x-axis, so its velocity vector has no y component. The y component of the velocity is zero. Now, our diagram now looks a bit different. In the perspective of the sun, the satellite is not just entering the planetary orbit from below, but it's actually getting pulled by the velocity of the planet. If the planet's moving this way, the satellite's getting dragged that way along with it. 
Since the planet only has an x component velocity, our satellite's initial velocity vector now looks like this. It has the original velocity in the y component, but now additionally, there's an x component that is the velocity of the planet. For this very reason, in the reference frame of the sun, it's not approaching from below anymore. It has both x and y components, so it's approaching from the side. Now, the outgoing velocity is similarly gaining from the orbital velocity of the planet. So this becomes little usx plus capital UP on the x component, but still zero on the y component of the exiting velocity. So what's the change in velocity, you ask? Well, the change in velocity is the magnitude of the outgoing velocity minus the magnitude of the incoming velocity. To calculate each of these, we take the square root of the sum of the x and y components squared. So this becomes, which eventually tidies up to this. So as an example, let's plug in some made up numbers. Let's say that the initial and final speed of the satellite, little usx and little usy is one kilometers per second. And let's say the planet velocity, capital UP, is 10 kilometers per second. If we plug in these numbers, we find that the change in velocity is 0.95 kilometers per second. You gained almost a kilometer per second for absolutely free using gravitational assist. Since energy and momentum needs to be conserved, the spacecraft is actually stealing a small amount of momentum from the planet. This momentum transfer actually allows the spacecraft to gain speed and alter its trajectory, whilst the planet loses a small amount of momentum in the process. It's negligible though. Now the example I showed was for a satellite approaching from behind the planet. In this case, the satellite sped up. But if instead the satellite were to approach in front of the planet, the velocity vectors for the orbit of the planet and for the outgoing vector of the satellite would be in opposite directions to the motion of the planet. And it doesn't take a genius to realize that if the satellite comes from in front of the planet, it actually slows down. The change in velocity, delta v, would be negative. I'll leave that as an exercise for you to do as homework. One more thing, here I've shown you the most simple configuration, but in reality, the satellite can come into the orbit and exit the orbit at different angles. But the principle is exactly the same. You just calculate those velocity vectors and correct for the orbital velocity of the planet. Why don't you have a go for yourself? I'll link a paper in the description box below if you really get stuck and it details everything. Great, so now you know how gravity assist works, let's get back to JUICE. JUICE stands for Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, and its primary objective is to study Jupiter and its three largest icy moons, Ganymede, Europa, and Callisto. These moons are believed to have subsurface oceans that could potentially harbor life, making them prime targets for astrobiology research. Now, we could have sent JUICE on a direct trajectory to Jupiter, but as I said in my previous video on home and transfer, it could be incredibly expensive in terms of fuel to get there, but also you need fuel just to break and slow down so that you can actually get captured by Jupiter and enter its orbit on approach. Ideally, you need enough velocity to escape Earth's gravity, gain enough speed to get to Jupiter in a reasonable time, but not go too fast that you completely miss it and need to hit the brakes when you get there. Ideally, you want to save as much fuel as possible to do science once you're there. So it's all about precision timing and calculations to get those velocities perfect with the help of gravity assist. So last week, JUICE made a gravitational swing around the moon, which boosted its speed by 0.9 kilometers per second relative to the sun. And this put it in the perfect trajectory for then a swing around the Earth. 
However, the gravity assist around the Earth wasn't for acceleration, but instead for deceleration. The flyby of Earth reduced Stu's speed by 4.8 kilometers per second relative to the Sun guiding Juice onto a new trajectory towards Venus for its next gravitational assist next year in 2025. By slowing it down, Juice won't have to hit the brakes when it gets there and can be prepared for a much larger gravity assist. Juice will have several more gravity assists. After Venus, it will be doing two more loops around the Moon and Earth before its approach to Jupiter in 2030. So it still has a very long way to go, and although the mass may have made it look easy here, it's anything but so. With all the incident and outgoing angles taken into account, you also need to take into account things like solar wind, which will have some force acting on the satellite, making it need adjustments. Precision and timing is everything to get it right. Even a tiny offset could send it off in completely the wrong direction. But last week's flyby around the Earth and Moon saved Jupiter about 100 kilograms of fuel. Now this is super important because like I said, you want to save as much fuel as possible. And more importantly so because Juice already lost quite a bit of fuel early on to its mission because of an antenna which refused to unfold. By jittering it around, they managed to set it free, but that used up about 10 kilograms of fuel. Now I know 2031 sounds like a very long way away, but it will be well worth it and there's still plenty of science that can be done along the way. Just look at all these beautiful images of the moon that is taken during this flyby. I'm going to link a tool down below so you can follow Juice on its incredible journey. Anyway, that's all I have time for this week. Thank you so much to my YouTube Perks members for supporting this video. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to leave me a like, share and subscribe.